Well, many of you know I love to read books, uh, so much so that I wrote a whole book about reading books. And uh, I'm always encouraged to hear from readers who have put new emphasis on uh, the priority of book reading in their own lives because of the book that I wrote. It's a, it's a powerful discipline in the Christian life, as you know, Pastor John. And I'm reminded of an episode we did this spring about how 1% of a book can change your life. That was the title, 1% of a book can change your life. Uh, the title of APJ 1910. Books have played a huge role in your development, and I know this, Pastor John, because every once in a while I get uh, to study a book from your library. I get to borrow it and take a peek at how you marked it up. Most recently, I looked through your copy of Mortimer Adler's classic, How to Read a Book, uh, because I was working on another project in the works, actually a book about this podcast, actually, but (laughs) it's getting too complex with books. We'll talk about that later. Uh, But just being able to thumb through your own book was really instructive to see what sentences you underlined and what sections you marked up and uh, how you jotted down notes in the front and back of the book. And perhaps maybe we could talk about how you mark up your books in the future. I think that would be really fascinating to hear. But this week, for these next two episodes, I want you to explain to us why. Why do you read books? And then who do you read? So the why today and the who on Thursday. So first, speaking from a macro perspective, what has been the impact of books on your life? Well, what a wonderful question. (laughs) (laughs) It would be hard to overstate the life-shaping impact of books on my life. Hmm. But mm, I'm going to go back a little bit and lay a foundation. Foundation number one is the Bible is a book. The implications of that fact are simply staggering. When God contemplated all the possible ways that existed for him as an infinite, omnipotent, all-wise God to transmit and preserve his revelation to the world, he chose a book. Mm. And that's simply Astonishing. We have no other authoritative access to the knowledge of God and the way of salvation and how to live a a life pleasing to the Lord than through this book, either directly by reading it or indirectly from others who have read it. The book is absolutely unique. It's inspired in all of its words, and that inspiration secures the sufficiency of the book in equipping us for every good deed. I mean, that very phrase in 2 Timothy 2.17, every good deed, is, is amazing to me. It's an awesome claim that we are equipped, fitted out by this book for every good deed that God expects of us. He won't expect of us anything he doesn't equip us to do through this book. So it's astonishing how unique and powerful this book is. And then you add to that Ephesians 3, 4, where Paul said, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. That's breathtaking to me, that reading the book, so the inspiration of the book and the reading of the book are the junctures between God and man where saving truth is moved from the divine mind into the human mind and spirit. This is just staggering implications of saying that reading is the way you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, Paul says. And of course, it's uh, not possible without the almighty agency of the Holy Spirit. It's not merely an intellectual affair, it's, but it's not less than an intellectual affair because God has ordained that his truth come through a book. And reading is a work of the mind. And of course, it also doesn't mean, nothing I've said is, I intend to imply that we could just go about this in our own little private cubicle without taking anybody else into account. The Bible is crystal clear that God has appointed pastors and teachers, people with spiritual gifts, and those gifts include wisdom and knowledge and prophecy and teaching and other ways that humans clarify and apply and inspire us with the scriptures. So even, even though God is giving us a book, he means for us to understand the book and apply the book and, and be inspired by the book with the help of other people who are dead <laughs> and left their insights in books 
and, and who are alive and, and, and teach us and preach and counsel and converse with us. So, once the reality of God's privileging the written word with his choice of a book as the decisive means by which he would reveal and preserve the revelation of himself, once that has sunk in, you just can never be indifferent to the reality of books. Again, God has privileged the book, honored the book, elevated the book, esteemed the book above all other means for his centuries-long preservation and explanation of his revelation. So when I say it would be hard to overstate the life-shaping impact of books on my life, I think I'm saying something very much in line with God's purposes for the world. All that to justify my sentence. <laughs> so, so let me be specific in answer to your, to your question. Number one, books have shown me the glory and the greatness and the character and the attributes and the beauties of God. Mm-hmm. Number two, books have convicted me of sin. In fact, most books convict me of sin one way or the other. There was an extended period of time in Germany when every Sunday evening I would read an extended portion of Edward's religious affections and found myself devastated week in and week out as he peeled away the layers of the self-exaltation of my heart. Number three, Books have shown me the path of righteousness. Number four, books have given me inspiration and encouragement in some of my most difficult days, and I'm thinking here mainly of biography. Number five, books have shaped the way I think and the way I express myself. And here I'm thinking, of course, of C.S. Lewis. Here, razor-sharp logic and a deep belief in the reality of reason and logic while never elevating it above the essential importance of the imagination and the affections. And, and it's, it's not just only his deep belief in exemplification, setting an example of logic, but the, the touchable, smellable, tasteable concreteness of his language. Oh, the power of the concrete over the abstract in helping people grasp the greatest things. Number six, books have cultivated deep convictions in me about things like the aims of reading. I think here of E.D. Hirsch in his book, Validity Interpretation, that persuaded me profoundly that the only objective grounds for any claim to validity in one's interpretation is that we have found an author's intention in writing. I think that's right, and what a vast implication it has for how you read everything. And and finally, I would say books have clarified for me biblical concepts that I may never have gotten good clarity on myself because of how extensive the scope of one's grasp needs to be of scriptures in order to to synthesize the way books do. And I'm thinking here of George Ladd, for example, my one of my professors, George Ladd's New Testament theology or his his book, The Presence of the Future. So that's a that's a that's the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. To the person, Tony, who struggles with reading, I would simply say, join me. Join limited, slow reading, John Piper. Admit your limitations. Lay down all resentments and anger and self-pity and self-justification and humbly accept your limitations. Admit them and then do the best you can. Be thankful for every measure of reading you're able to do. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Pastor John. And don't miss that Ephesians 3, 4 mentioned at the beginning. Pastor John mentioned that at the start of this episode. There's a whole theology of reading in that one little verse, Ephesians 3, 4. Well, as you could hear, Pastor John is hardly unable to resist from giving us a whole list of book recommendations. So let's do that next time. Limited, slow reading. John Piper is going to give us 10 of his favorite authors when it comes to reading theology for your soul. That's Thursday. I'm Tony Ranke. See you then.